know, I personally feel that that such a program uh, makes people proud about what they're doing. They see that when they apply their knowledge into not only, you know, like science can be useful for social contribution and how all these programs led into results that were significant to the community. Hello, my name is Ron Harris. Today I would like to share with you some vital lessons my research team and I have learned through conducting what we call full spectrum risk reduction experiments, mostly in Indonesia. These experiments help fill a gap for humanitarian geoscience, which is supported by Geoscience Without Borders. And much of what I will present would not have happened without the support and encouragement of GWB. The work is also conducted through two other organizations I'm involved with, In Harm's Way and the Waste Consortium. Both are nonprofit organizations with diverse uh, multidisciplinary collaborations of academics and government and other nonprofit organizations, all dedicated to natural disaster risk reduction worldwide. We characterize our work with the metaphor of building bridges over troubled waters. The most troubled waters are in the continent, continent collision corridor or CCC of South Asia and Indonesia. Although this area represents only 12% of Earth's landmass, the natural hazards in this region account for 85% of the Earth's fatalities. The hazard map on the right shows um, earthquake, tsunami and cyclonic risks shown here. The tsunamis are the pink areas, the warm colors are the seismic hazards, and the green are the cyclones and typhoons. The goal of the research is to reduce the losses to nature that are increasing in the CCC, to, re to reduce the common occurrence of these mass graves. The way we really should look at the world when considering how to reduce losses in nature is this map, which is scaled to show natural disasters per country. The CCC obviously needs the most help by far to reverse the growing trend of mass graves. I've been working in the CCC for over 30 years collecting data from a wide variety of sources to formulate forecasts of who is most at risk. Some of these methods involve compiling and translating historical accounts of past geophysical events, prospecting for geological evidence of large tsunamis and earthquakes, and evaluating who is most at risk from ground shaking by making our own tiny little earthquakes and using geophones to collect the data so we truly are listening to the earth. The premise I have worked under is that the technical aspects of assessing risk or listening to earth was my responsibility as a, as a scientist and that somehow the hazard risk information and what to do about it would trickle down to those in harm's way. However, I, I really never investigated if trickle down worked. For example, we identified two major seismic gaps along the Sunda subduction zone of Indonesia that had accumulated enough elastic strain energy to cause mega thrust earthquakes. And these earthquakes unleash a host of natural hazards, including strong ground motion, liquefaction, land level changes, tsunamis, stress contagion on other faults and thousands of landslides. And this is how it works. This animation here is like looking at the, at the west coast of Sumatra. So this would be Sumatra Island here, and this would be the Asian plate. And subducting underneath that plate would be the Indo-Australia plate. As the lower plate subducts, it pulls the upper plate with it. Essentially, the coastlines of Sumatra and Java are being and have been pulled to the east over a period of hundreds of years, resulting in accumulation, resulting in accumulation of elastic strain energy shown here in red. Eventually, what happens is that the frictional resistance of sliding is overcome and 
all the strain that's accumulated is suddenly released to produce a megathrust earthquake and a tsunami from a disturbance in, in the ocean that collapses and sends the destructive energy of the earthquake far more um, afield than the ground shaking does. These data allowed us to publish forecasts in 2002 about eventual megathrust earthquakes, which would happen in the future. We found that about 150 million people were at risk of strong ground motion and 6 million um, lived in tsunami inundation zones of these seismic gaps. Two years after we published our forecast, it happened. The, uh, in 2004, the northern seismic gap ruptured and it was the third largest earthquake ever recorded and the largest earthquake induced tsunami in history. The, the press somehow found out about our forecast and converged on my office. And the story that they were trying to sell is that a geologist had predicted the earthquake, but no one listened. But that was not the case at all. The people were totally caught off guard. They had no idea about what a tsunami was or how to respond. It was not them, but it was us that failed. I knew perhaps as well as anyone that what was going to happen, but I didn't deliver the warning to the last mile, those who were actually in harm's way. And so I gave us a A minus on risk assessment, but we totally failed the communication and risk reduction. Since the 2004 disaster, we have constructed a series of numerical models that simulate megathrust earthquakes in Java, in the Java seismic gap, which is still waiting to have its megathrust earthquakes. Uh, this is a movie of the tsunami model that we constructed for Bali, which is the most populated area. It has over 600,000 people inhabiting the inundation zone, and that's not including the many tourists that flock to this area, which could add at least another 600,000 at any point. The International Airport is right here, and the first tsunami waves arrive around 20 minutes after the earthquake, and they reach heights of about 20 meters in most places. We use the numerical model data to construct this series of tsunami hazard maps for the Java tsunami gap that show the wave height in blue right here and the inundation zone um, in, uh, in these different colors and also the amount of people that live in the inundation zone here in red, like you can see here for Dempasar 600,000. The model also provides a time series for each one of these areas that shows when the first wave arrives. And it's usually 20 minutes after the earthquake. The most primitive, quote unquote, primitive peoples of all those affected by the 2004 earthquake and tsunami were the sea gypsies of the offshore islands that you can see over here to, to, um, to the right. And the star here is actually the epicenter of that earth earthquake. And so these were the people who were actually closest to the epicenter and had the least time to respond. But amazingly, they suffered the least casualties per capita. Their successful response to the hazard was due mostly to their generational stories of a monster called Laboon, the wave that eats people. According to this myth, the ground shakes when Laboon is coming. And even though they had the science wrong about what a tsunami is and had no risk assessment. They had developed community response efficacy that saved their lives. They used natural warning signs and they self-evacuated. The world had to learn the hard way that it requires more than just risk assessment to save lives. And our job does not end with a risk assessment. It actually starts there. To bridge this gap between risk assessment and reduction, involves listening to the people and helping them to listen to the earth. It requires us to close the communication gap. It includes community-led plans, engineer surveys, social media campaigns, and the practice and evaluation of risk reduction strategies. These steps are proactive because they focus on preparedness. 
which is much less expensive in lives and infrastructure than the reactive approach of waiting for something to happen and sending billions of dollars in to provide relief. But no matter how much is spent after the disaster, lives have been lost. We are rediscovering the humanity of disaster mitigation, where we don't just pass through a village on our way to collect data, but we now go to the village first and listen and work with them. This is not a natural thing for scientists to do, so I walked across campus to enlist the expertise of social scientists specializing in these human aspects of implementing risk reduction strategies. That walk was a game changer. This is where GWB comes in. They provide essential funds for integrating the full spectrum of natural disaster mitigation activities, not just assessing risk, but providing support for helping people listen to the earth. The projects that GWB funds encourage experiments in building resilience and developing response efficacy. So thank you so much, GWB. With the help of GWB, with Spirit had hundreds of meetings with students and community leaders in the, in the highest risk areas. And we asked questions through surveys and Q&A and, and listened to concerns and ideas and then plan and implement risk reduction activities. Singing and dancing is a big part of the Indonesian culture. So it is their go-to method for communicating risk and building response efficacy. This is a song of um, one of our Indonesian colleagues composed as to what to do during an earthquake. <laughs> So there are also, there's also a similar song about the natural warning signs of the tsunami. And the funny thing is that as we go from village to village, sometimes the songs arrive before we do. And that's a good thing. One of the recommendations made by another Indonesian student is what he called ARC, which is Art for Resilient Communities, where a diverse group from different sectors of society come together to build a diorama of their community and its hazards. One of the most important aspects of the di dioramas are the photographs that um, you see on the side here. And these photos were taken by local citizens who were tasked with documenting potential hazards. The community met to then decide based on these photos, what action to take about each hazard. While this slide really deserves more time than we have, we've also constructed an app which dovetails with the tactile dioramas to indicate or to integrate data from Google Earth for showing the best route of evacuation from any point on a map that you select. Uh, the red zone in the map on the right is, is where it takes more than 20 minutes to actually evacuate. And so it's important for people to know that. To help emphasize the importance of self-evacuation, we have condensed the crucial parts of tsunami survival into three numbers, 20, 20, 20. It works this way. In coastal regions, if you feel an earthquake that lasts for at least 20 seconds, it could have directly or indirectly caused a tsunami. Most tsunamis arrive within 20 minutes after the earthquake and run up to at least 20 meters. The Indonesian government has now adopted the 2020-20 principle for communicating self-evacuation as the primary approach now for tsunami evacuation. Although they already had posted signs throughout the country for where to evacuate, the when and how fast and how high was not communicated. But now it is because the 2020-20 signs have been added to these already existing signs, which now help the people self-evacuate. The 2020-20 principle also informs and encourages tsunami evacuation drills, which may be the most effective and definitely the most enjoyable ways to develop response efficacy. We say ready, set, go, and the groups take off. Some make it in some make it to 20 meters and some don't. And sometimes no one makes it there. 
But whatever the outcome, the community is now engaged in an ongoing competition of what we call a tsunami evacuation race. And it's interesting because like the Gandhi marches, the group ends up being several times larger than when we started. And now evacuation drills are happening throughout Indonesia thanks to the support of GWB. I will close with this slightly altered quote by Ben Franklin, that an ounce of disaster prevention is worth many times more than tons of disaster relief. The humanity of mitigation aims to increase the self-efficacy of people in hazard-prone environments to demonstrate that they have the resources, organization, and practices to withstand the worst effects of natural hazards. Thank you. Welcome, my name is Silvio De Angelis. I'm a reader at the University of Liverpool in the UK. Uh, today I will present an overview of a project that was funded by the Society of Exploration Geophysics through the Geoscientists Without Borders program. Uh, this project is aimed at the development of a modern volcano monitoring system in Guatemala, a country where volcanic hazard can have significant impacts on both population and infrastructure. As I mentioned, this project was supported by Geoscientists Without Borders, uh, which is a program funded by Schlumberger through the Society of Exploration Geophysics. And this program is squarely aimed at supporting humanitarian applications of geophysics and development. Uh, the GWD ethos was a perfect match for the motivations that had taken us to work in Guatemala for the past 10 years. Before we start, a uh, brief introduction to who we are, uh, the project partners with this initiative. Uh, although the project ended up involving a large number of people, um, including both private and public organisations, the three main partners were the University of Liverpool, the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology and in made the National Geological Survey for Guatemala. Going straight into the details of our project, we can start with some brief geological context. Santa Maria Santiaguito is the location of our project. Santiaguito is located in Central America, along the Central um, American Volcanic Arc, uh, which runs parallel to the Middle American Trench, uh, where the Caucasus Plate subducts underneath the Caribbean Plate. To become familiar with some names and places, uh, San Seguito is a lava dome complex that is part of the Santa Maria volcano. Santa Maria produced a VI6 uh, eruption in 1902 after over 500 years of dormancy. Here you can see some numbers for that eruption. The intensity of the eruption was six on the volcanic explosivity index scale uh, or VI and it was one of the three largest in the 20th century. The eruption left a horseshoe-shaped crater of about one kilometer diameter and about 300 meters deep. The Santiaguito Lava Dome complex grew inside the crater that was left by the 1902 eruption of Santa Maria, as we can see in this image from the Sentinel satellite. We can see the summit of Santa Maria and Santiaguito. The image also shows the proximity of the city of Quetzaltenango to the north-northwest of Santa Maria Santiaguito and some extensive farming to the south-southwest. This is the view from the summit of Santa Maria standing at 3,772 meters elevation, looking down onto the Santiaguito Dome complex. Santiaguito uh, is a complex of four lava domes uh, that were formed between 1922 and 1984 during different cycles of lava extrusion. Caliente, to the left in this photo, is the one that is presently active. This is a photo of Caliente taken in 2020 during our last trip to Guatemala. We can see a full crater with the rim overtopped by several tens of meters of lava. And this is one of the most hazardous situations at San Tiguito, considering that the lava dome may suddenly become unstable and collapse, triggering pyroclastic flows in the southeast direction. Because it's probably easier to understand the scale of volcanic events and hazards from pictures than words, I'll now show a few images of different events that were taken during our recent trips to San Tiguito. 
this one is a large explosion that occurred in May 2016. For reference, Santa Maria that you see here in the foreground of the ash cloud is nearly 4,000 meters high. These large ash plumes are likely to collapse and they can generate pyrocastic flows which can travel along the flanks of the volcano with the potential to reach farms and in less frequent cases, larger population centers. Uh, these photos, for example, show the view from one of the coffee farms around San Tiguito before and uh, during a large explosion. In this slide, you will now watch a short video of a hot laha passing under and very close to the Castillo de Almas bridge along the Inter-American Highway. The video is just a few seconds long, but it's long enough to appreciate the scale and power of these mud flows. Our team had already been working in Guatemala for a few years on temporary geophysical experiments when we decided to start our GWB project. The aims of this project were simple, installing modern seismic equipment to monitor the volcano, implementing easy to use tools to process the newly collected data and train local scientists in modern technology and methods for volcano monitoring. We started by selecting four candidate sites for the new equipment, all within 1.5 to 6.5 kilometers from the active vent at Caliente. Uh, these sites are shown in the map here. Our initial installations were simple. The photo here shows a typical seismometer installation at one of the test sites. These installations consisted of a simple plastic barrel with concrete at its base to improve coupling between the instruments and the ground, and the stations were powered by solar panels and batteries. Our tests were successful. Um, here is an example of data uh, recorded uh, showing a variety of signals and relatively low noise levels. All sites appeared to be suitable and although our initial proposal included only two stations, we decided to keep all four sites. Our project achieved two firsts. For the first time, a permanent broadband seismometer was installed at San Tiguito and for the first time, a permanent seismic station was installed at the base of the Caliente Dome. Um, and the four stations, of course, are operational as we speak. Following the test phase in 2019, we started to work to make the stations permanent. This was a significant undertaking as work at San Tiguito is extremely physical. Some sites require many hours of hiking and advanced mountaining skills to be reached, as you can see in the pictures. The photo on the left was taken whilst descending at the base of the domes only meters from them. These are the initial stages of the excavation of the closest station to Caliente. In the photo on the left, you see digging of the trench with cables. And in the other photo, you can see the site location with the Santiago domes in the background. Some of these sites were easier to reach. Uh, you can see work done to build a communication tower um, at one of the sites and in the other photo, uh, one of the mini houses that hosted the equipment. The small houses already existed, so what we did was to refurbish and secure them to house the new equipment. This is the inside of one of the casetas, the small houses, with all the equipment for the typical station listed here. Solar panels, antennas and a lightning protection system were of course installed outside on the roof of the casetas. These are some of the people that helped us. Staff of Insiwome was key to grant access to the sites and help with construction and technical sites of the installations. Local communities were involved and provided the most valuable support and help. The photo to the left is a picture of Dom Geronimo, who lives at the base of Santa Maria and who joined us in every trip to the domes. Since this is a seismology-based project, I thought I would show a couple of seismograms from the nearly three years of continuous data collected so far. The images here show examples of a lahar record in the top panel and a large explosion with associated PFs in the bottom panel. So the project has sustainability at its heart. We designed the stations according to modern and widely accepted standards. Data transmission is integrated within the Guatemala National Seismic Network and the stations are built to only require minimal maintenance. 
Some highlights about training efforts um, are that before the current COVID situation, we were able to organize a training workshop in Guatemala City. The workshop was attended by more than 25 local scientists that work for Mea Comrade, the National Civil Protection of Guatemala. Here you can see the program for the workshop. Also, the head of volcanology in Sibume spent three months in Liverpool for an internship working with our volcanology physics research group. Many PhD students have benefited from the data collected and some played a major role in the implementation of software for volcano seismic data analysis. Some of the software is already published and openly available. Uh, you can see some of the links below and some other is underway. Finally, I would like to leave you with some thoughts on the lessons that have been learned during the project. Some are pretty obvious, but I feel that it is important to be reminded of such simple things when embarking on a project like the one that we have just concluded. The key points to keep in mind for me are the engagement with the local communities, planning with sustainability in mind and be realistic. Start simple and build complexity when and if feasible. Uh, with this, I want to thank you um, for listening and I can take questions if there's any. Thank you. I have you know, for, first question, you know, like both of you to to address what were your experiences in in, in these projects as far as uh, particularly as you were wrapping up, you know, the, the first phases of neighboring communities wanting to participate or, 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 or extend the activities as well as you both talk about sort of the national programs, but um, were there was there engagement by other governmental authorities, higher governmental authorities to try to propagate the models even further and in, in, in what you guys did in your work. Ron, you want to go first? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've we've been able to uh, get the attention of of the president and um, you know the leaders essentially at the very top, mainly because some of the television interviews that we had after a presentation went viral. For example, we made a presentation at this one coastal city and, um, you know, they just asked us, you know, what to expect. And we said, well, a mega thrust earthquake could come at any time in the Java tsunami gap, uh, seismic gap. And, um, and they're like, you know the size of the one in Sumatra and we're like it, well it could be close to that and for some reason you know it just hit struck the right chord when it was broadcast and all of a sudden people started telling everybody about it and and so the president of Indonesia you know um, asked the geophysical survey there you know why they hadn't told anybody about this and and that made a huge difference because um this geophysical sur sur survey was was kind of downplaying the whole hazard because uh they don't want to scare people and that's a cultural thing right and so um, you know, we had 40,000 views on that interview within 24 hours, and then it just kept going and uh, showing the power of mass media, which we haven't been able to use very much for this in the past. But that's just one example. OK, um, for me, um, the, in general, the engagement of the local communities, I, I work in places that are so the main head offices of the National Geological Survey, of course, are in Guatemala City, which is the capital city, over 10 million people. So it's a big population center, but most of the volcanoes are outside in more rural areas. So I generally work with quite small communities. Um, and my experience, their interest is really high. I always I was very well received and I was helped as much as they could so that the actual strictly speaking the engagement of local community was really high in my experience in terms of the organizations at the local level because i went to guatemala after almost 10 years of experience working with the geological survey and the civil protection there 
Um, my relationships were already quite solid, so I, it was good. They were interested. There was a history of working together, so it was easy to get along and work together. And then in my specific case, there was a, um, a coincidence, rather unfortunate, I would say. We were starting a project, the, one of the largest eruption in the last hundred years happened in Guatemala in 2018, uh, Fuego erupted, which is quite close to San Diego, which we were aiming to monitor. Um, and unfortunately, over 400 people died, 10,000 people were displaced. There was a massive impact on, on society and population from that eruption. So at that point, uh, the combination of this event and the um, sort of high history working in Guatemala and the ongoing project came together and attracted the attention of many other organizations, even on a much larger scale. So um, other organizations like the World Bank uh, got involved. I got sponsorship from the uh, British government to the UK embassy in, um, in Guatemala. So it, it became a much larger effort. The United States Geological Survey became really involved. Uh, through the USAID program. Um, so there's, you know, it grew in some ways much bigger than I anticipated. Um, I refrain from using the word luckily because of course it's on the back of a, a tragedy, but in some ways, if we can have something positive coming out of this is that something was done uh, to prevent that for the future. Great. So. Uh... A bunch of questions have come in. Um, so can you talk about how structured the approaches uh, for community involvement in the project design? And is that a, and if so, is there a standard model that GWB uh, uses to, to engage community members or is this a on the ground kind of decision making process? Go ahead, Silvio. Uh, for me, it's quite structured um, in the sense that um, because I tend to work in countries where uh, part of it is logistical, I tend to work in places where um, somewhat you need cooperation from the local communities to keep everything up and running. Uh, some of the uh, environmental conditions are fairly extreme. Um, it's very difficult to reach some of these sites. You can only get there. Um, you know, with the help of local people and local knowledge. So in my case, it's fairly structured. In Guatemala sp specifically, I have a lot of experience. So at this time I have my own contact so I can organize things in the planning phase of the project directly with the local communities. Because of my long term experience, I do have access directly to to even like you know, the, the mayor of a very small town nearby San Tiguito might have 10,000 people live there or even less, and, and I can directly communicate with them. When I go to other countries, generally I go through the National Geological Survey or the Civil Protection or my sort of local government contact. Uh, but I always make sure that once we plan the deployments, um, we, we sort of like ensure that we go there and agreements are already in place for involvement on the local community. And this is logistical, but I think it is also important, and I, I usually do this, to, to spend some time to involve them in the project itself. Um, I usually uh, travel. I can speak Spanish, so in most of these countries I, I don't have problems. So in countries where I don't speak the language, I usually travel with somebody that speaks the language. Uh, so we can have uh, sort of like community gatherings where we explain things, we show what we're doing. Um, we often I try to leave books when I can for the local libraries. Everywhere I go, I make a point of bringing 10 or 15 books for the local library. Um, and I know this sound small things but you know when you're looking at small places where you have 100 150 people and they're strongly affected by this even small actions to improve preparedness can actually do make a difference so um what came to my my mind is uh the three-pronged approach that we use it's pretty structured whenever we go to a location we have three teams. We have a we have an assessment team, which is mostly the the hard science. You know that uh, we're working trying to determine what's happened in the past. We're 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 trying to increase the monitoring and 
do the kind of things that normally geoscientists would we would do. And then we have another team which is tasked with communication. And essentially um, that team um, is responsible and usually led by social scientists for uh, allowing the community to understand what we're doing and um, how that will impact them and also helping them by conducting uh, questionnaire surveys to assess uh, you know how much confidence they have in their ability to recognize natural signs and self-evacuate and so we've conducted thousands of surveys um, and and then the third group is focused on implementation which would involve like making the dioramas or doing tsunami evacuation drills and the cool thing about it is that the students that we have cycle through students from Indonesia and also the faculty from Indonesia cycle through those three groups because that's one of the most important things we think is that uh, disaster mitigation is everybody's responsibility since no one has been tasked with the responsibility it has to be everybody's responsibility so each group needs to understand what the other groups are doing so they can be more effective great so a couple questions um i think these these are good inspirational uh, stories uh have come in you know as as a geophysicist um can you talk about how you got involved in the projects how did you come about developing them getting engaged with gwb and what are some of the skills you're looking for for some of the volunteers you're working with? Right. Um, do you want to go first? I can go first. Sure, sure. Um, so in terms of skills, uh, you know, the, the people who have uh, worked the best with us are the ones who are most open to learning new skills because they're really there's not like a major <laughs> that I can think of that it combines all these things. There should be, or there maybe there are at some schools, but um, it's it's the ability to to be able to feel comfortable in a multidisciplinary um, setting and uh, and being able to be flexible and um, most importantly to to be able to. Uh, see the connections between the hard and soft sciences and 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 make co uh, contributions like some of the Indonesian students have done that I showed an example of like the ARC project or you know composing these songs and and other types of things that are catchy and for a long time we really tried to make progress with you know helping people overcome their misconceptions so we give a a survey before the talk we give a survey after the talk and initially nothing really happened the people said the same thing at the end as they did in the beginning and so the social scientists help us to fix that and um and and the, what was lacking was the emotional appeal because that's what really helps people change is is when they're connected emotionally and and that's that's where we really need a lot of help. Um, for me, it's fairly similar. Uh, the the number of the, the the skills I'm usually after uh, from what my students and all others have been involved is being open to learning and being able to work in challenging situations and in a sort of diverse environment as well. As a factor, that's really important. Uh, you're traveling to countries where things are often fairly different from what we used to on you know in our everyday life so it certainly requires a certain level of being open-minded and um and sort of like willing to learn from others and learn about um, different cultures and different traditions um and also um for my specific projects often requires a strong passion for the outdoors S some of the the work is it's quite extreme and physical, so you really have to be passionate to be out there 
uh, climb a mountain for three days, sleep there. Uh, something that I found extremely rewarding. It's something that's probably the best part of my job. The thing I love the most about my job, but it is definitely a requisite. Uh, in terms of how I came about GWB and these type of projects, for me, um, I got to know GWB because before moving to the UK, I worked for many years in the United States, uh, mostly in earthquake and volcano observatories. Um, so I was familiar with colleagues that have worked with GWB in the past in, in Guatemala. And Guatemala itself, it's just because it was close to my research interest, that the type of volcanism that, um, that um, Guatemala has was just close to my research interest. So I started working there about 10 years ago and then I, I loved the place. I made friends and in some ways was like my, um, my personal relationships that then drove me and motivated me to, to continue working there and build something bigger. Great, great. So both of you address this uh, to, to, to some level, but maybe you can expand on it. Um, person asks, uh, in some places, volcanoes and other features and events um, have a really strong cultural and heritage uh, uh, significance. Does this kind of heritage connection affect your work and then how the local community responds to your work? Um, it does. So I, I worked for a few years in the, in the Caribbean as well. And um, in, I worked in uh, South America. So there's, there's different links to uh, cultural heritage, religion and, and other things. There are some aspects, uh, there's some cultural sensitivity to, to be taken into account when you go to these places. Um, for me, I generally go at my first step uh, through the course, the, the local scientist that might be more aware than I am of some things, not because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do respect to anybody and but I might not simply be aware of some things. And then I usually try to link with the local communities and, and before we start any work, sort of like get informed and learn from them what's possible and what's not possible. And in my experience, once you approach them with an open mind and you explain what your aims are, uh, generally people are, um, they are pretty open. They, they will tell you what the limitations are, what they consider disrespectful, what shouldn't be done. And as long as you uh, plan your work around this, uh, generally it's not a problem. And in my experience, um, it's always possible to plan things around um, respecting people. It, it really is not um, a major issue. It's just a matter of wanting to do it and taking it into account. Yeah, I, I would just echo that, what Silvio says, um, especially the cultural aspects. Uh, one good thing about uh, most of the work that we've done is in, in, in Indonesia and there, you know, they, they have, um, you know, one of their most important government principles is that you respect each other's religions. And what we found is that disaster mitigation and preparedness um, uh, are something that all religions and all people believe in. And so it's it's not like a, an issue that, you know, would cause conflict. And so what we found is that that um, we had we had Hindus and Christians and Muslims who would all come together. There's not very many activities that engender that kind of collaboration, but disaster mitigation does. Um, everybody's interested in having a safer community and building resilience. And, and those are central, um, you know, principles for each religion. And so um, we also had some, some, we've had to overcome some misconceptions about, you know, um, that a lot of these natural disasters are acts of God trying to punish people. And, and you know, that's something you have to walk very tenderly through. It's not just, you know, that's the whole world um, is trying to uh, deal with that, um, with that uh, problem. And, and the best way we've found to do that is to actually talk to the religious leaders themselves. For example, 
we had this one community that was threatened by um, a landslide uh, that dammed up the river and uh, the dam was breaking. And uh, we, we did a, an evacuation drill, but nobody showed up um, because of this idea of, well, if it happens, it happens. If I die, I die. And, um, and so we went to the e e imams of the local mosques there and talked to them and, and they were very open. And, and they, they wanted to protect their people. And so they got them back together again. And the second evacuation drill went very, very well. And then just a, a little while after that, the actual earthen dam broke. And, you know, they, they had seven minutes to evacuate and 428 homes were destroyed by the, by the, the outburst flood and only three people died. And that was mainly because of working with within the culture with the religious leaders to help them help their people overcome these these um, ideas that were causing problems. So, as part of this community engagement, um, you're talking about like with with community community leaders. Um, but did you actually also work with uh, first responder teams, like the volunteer firefighters and other emergency services, uh, you, know, you know, within those projects? And, and, and if so, what is your advice for how to engage them? Well, um, I'll just give you another example. On one of the islands we went to, um, uh, we'd already trained some of the people in the disaster mitigation agency, which before we kind of got there, their whole idea was to, to not really do anything until something happened. And that actual disaster mitigation meant emergency management or you know going in after things that already happened and and you know being heroes and 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 um excavating people who were buried from an earthquake or whatever and um and we helped them make a transition into thinking of what they can do during peacetime what they can do before the actual hazard occurs and um and and so in each community there's usually people who are working in the on the peripheries of this idea and so what we'd help them do is get together so we go and visit the red cross um and and get a person from there we we get the people who are monitoring earthquakes or the volcanoes and bring them on board we use this essentially the the emergency management people and we got some of them on, on on board and so we'd build a team and again we would divide the team up into three parts you know listening to the earth listening to the people helping the people listen to the earth and this is the first time a lot of those people have even met each other even though they're living in the same community and they're working kind of on the same things and it helped them focus uh, what they're doing on the issue of saving lives. And uh, that's made a huge difference. Um, for me, um, in the past, I have worked in first responders team, but because that was my job um, at the time. So it, it, I was part of first response teams as, a, as part of my job description, so I did it. In the recent experience related to, to this specific grant, I did work um, in, the, in the first response team for the eruption of Fuego, but not in the field. So not with uh, Bomberos, for example, the firefighters in Guatemala, um, but in the scientific first response team. So I, I was... Um, I was part of a team that uh, traveled to Guatemala um, and it was um, mostly uh, from the European Union Civil Protection and the United States Geological Survey and it was essentially an, an advisory scientific team that helped to set up a rapid response in terms of instrumentations, data processing, um, helping the local scientists to formulate some advice for the local government. Uh, but in that specific situation, I was not involved in, in actual field operation. And it is my opinion that we, we'll all, we all have a purpose and a job, and I, I think jobs should stay separate. Um, even though I've done it in the past because it was part of my job description and I, I would have the skills to do it, 
I would tend to think that it's best if people that are tasked to do that, do that. And scientists like myself, just I'm doing a different job now, um, work on something else to try and link all the pieces to, to make the responses as effective as it could be. Um, that, that's my my experience and, and my point of view on that. Um, and in terms of advice, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming by advice, uh, somebody means how you can get involved uh, with first response teams. Um, in, in Europe, which is the situation I'm most familiar, uh, there are training courses that are um, operated and run by the European Union Civil Protection, so you can get qualifications if you're like, for example, an electronics technician. Uh, you can get qualifications to work as an electronics technician in such response team and there's other aspects if you are more on the diplomatic side that there are also uh, qualifications for that so you, you can essentially get involved um, through sort of like civil protection or foreign offices type of departments so can i chris can, can i make one more comment mm -hmm. um i I think it's important to make a distinction between proactive responses and reactive responses. And, and that's where I think GWB really distinguishes itself is that its focus is on the proactive part, you know, doing stuff in advance. And yeah. this is the one of the hardest transitions for people to make because emergency management is and disaster relief is so, um, entrenched and and we think that's what disaster mitigation is but the events already occurred i mean you don't really after the event you don't really save very many lives by rushing in and i mean sure you dig a few people out you but most of the damage is done and you have to do the work before and and that's why um i think geoscientists with, with without borders is, is really making a huge contribution because that's the kind of support they provide for me to try to determine well who's most at risk and then focusing on those places and and doing the work up front and building resilience so that sure the the natural hazard is going to be a crisis no matter what happens but whether it's a disaster or not is totally a decision that is in our court. It's something that we decide whether it's a disaster. And that's because we can decide whether to prepare or not. I, you know, Ron, I think you, you largely addressed the next question, which is coming from Mike Loudon, who is the SEG Foundation Chair, but see if uh, either of you have more to add. Uh, he thanks both of you for, and your teams for the leadership in applying geoscience to the efforts uh, to help people across the world. As uh, the SEG Foundation continues to fundraise for GWB, what are some of these sound bites we can use with prospective donors to to attract new support for for the project? I think, Ron, I think you you gave a great one right there with the whole difference between reactive and proactive. Um, I don't know. Are, are are there other angles when you talk to folks about GWB? Um, you know that that sort of encapsulate that key difference and that impact point. Well, I mean, I personally, I I agree. I mean, a disaster, um, it's up to us to decide, to decide whether a national event is going to be a disaster in the future and what scale is of this disaster uh, is going to have. And in fact, this is probably decided many years before the event even happens. I mean, we're not talking about five, five days or five weeks. Um, it's the whole phase of preparing for it because you, you're not going to stop it. You know, an earthquake is going to happen, a tsunami is going to happen, a volcano is going to erupt. Um, that's, there's no way you can mitigate the event by stopping the event itself. You have to prepare people for dealing with it. And um, so that's really the, the most convincing thing, investing in preparing people and infrastructure for dealing with the, the natural event will mitigate the risk and will some instances reduce uh, casualties to zero. Um, the other argument for me is that it's a lot more cost effective, in my opinion, to prepare to deal with it than to deal with the consequences of it. 
it's just the and this is not just financial. If you consider, and I think I mentioned this in the podcast I did recently with GWB. Um, if you consider the impacts that, for example, volcanic eruption in my instance has on uh, children that go to school. Some people will just drop out of school. You will have thousands of people dropping out of school. That's a massive social impact that in countries that are still at the developing stage in some respects, progress is really slow and you can sort of erase that progress all of a sudden in a matter of just few hours. It will take a long time to recover from that and that recovery must be backed up by an investment, a financial investment, which is actually way bigger than you would have had to invest to prepare uh, for the situation, at least in my experience. Great. Yeah, I, Silvio said it best. I agree completely with, with that. And I, I think that um, just the act of prevention and building resilience and, and you know, and, and confidence in their ability to um, respond to natural signs and self-evacuate. And it's all about education and also practice. And, you know, even if it, it, it's one or two generations before whatever event that we were worried about happens, um, the Mokum people, which I talked about, had built in that resilience so that even though you know, the earthquake occurred 100 years after the last one. Um, several generations had passed on that that knowledge that they that they needed. And and when it happened, people were were, were ready. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think the most important thing to realize is that paying up front and doing things in advance is actually it builds self-reliance and self-reliance in and of itself is worth investing in that's very very good point so um back more on your projects uh what has sort of happened to the data that you guys have collected and used in your projects and is that openly available so other people can try to understand the the geoscience that was being done um, in, in my case, the data are uh, available through the Iris DMC facility. So this is for those that are familiar with the United States uh, seismology research institutions. Uh, is a place where everyone that, of course, has some technical knowledge uh, can go and download the, the data and use them. So these would be aimed probably mostly at research types. Um, they're also available through the United States Geological Survey, which streams the data from Guatemala to their offices for backup, and they're available from our service in, here in Liverpool. Um, all the products, uh, so all the bulletins and the images and everything that's been produced as a result of these are available through the um, National Geological Survey of Guatemala. And in fact, actually, Guatemala has a fairly open policy for all of their data, not just the data from GWB. Um, so generally speaking, they are openly available to everyone. Um, we generally do not impose uh, a grace period. My policy in my group is to release any da data that are publicly funded within six months. So this is usually our first, uh, you know, when we can first establish some sort of um, data connection streaming. So yeah, generally they are available. Um, to everyone who wishes to consult or use them. So in my in my case, uh, of course, as an academic, um, you know, I'm still expected to publish in the best journals. And so we still do that. But the most important way to to make the data available to the people are are these dioramas that we've been making in communities. And this is the this is the most amazing thing. For 500 US dollars, we can we can support a community in making a diorama. <clears throat> and that involves like getting people from different sectors of the community to come in and you know we we compensate them of any salary that they're losing from from 
you know, not working and that kind of thing. And we also provide the materials. And and that's a permanent thing, a permanent structure in the community that brings everybody together. And they have this big festival when they finish it, you know, and everybody goes and sees where their house is and what the hazards are and the photos and and um, and that brings the data to the community level where they can understand it because there's no way they're going to understand our journal art our articles for one reason they're written in English and they're also have a lot of technical language and and they also don't have access to it and so personalizing it village by village is uh, what our goal is okay can you please talk about the education and training that it, uh, is provided to local collaborators to support the sustainability of the scientific program in the long term. Um, in, in my in my instance, um, because the project was fairly targeted, so we already had two very well defined um, local collaborators, which were the um, National Geological Survey and the um, National Civil Protection of Guatemala. Um, training was mostly done um, either on the job, so we always had a team that involved us from outside, but also uh, all the technical stuff and the scientific stuff from these organizations. So everything has been done with them. So there was a component of training on the job. Um, and um, Guatemala has a rather uh, peculiar situation in the sense that there's really no university program in geophysics and geohazards. So it's quite difficult um, so that most of the people that work um, in, you know, using geophysical data, are, they usually have a background of a geology undergraduate degree in the best case scenario, and most of them are physicists. So, uh, which is good that they have a solid background, but there's a lot of training that needs to be done to translate the skills of a physicist to the skills of geophysicists. So, um, so general training is on the job and in terms of um, clearly uh, more advanced things that, you know, they will need to learn in terms of making good use of the data. Uh, in my instance, I just uh, I just hosted people for three, four months uh, in, in Liverpool. So they, they came and they stayed four months with me and they worked with my students and we developed some of the systems that they're now in place and they're using in real time for early warnings and alarms together so they they took active part in the development i was lucky enough that being this mostly physicist they came having a very strong foundation for example in programming so i didn't have to work much on that I only had to work on the geophysics aspects of, of the training um, and it was quite successful. Um, in other instances, we're talking about technicians, so they they need to be trained in, in good um, practice for the field and how to make a station, a seismic station, you know, robust, long lasting and how to optimize telemetry, what's the best way of data from one place to the other. So there's different aspects. Um, I don't think there's one size fits all uh, training for, for technical stuff. It really depends on the situation. Um, in, in my case, I would say it probably was quite close to what somebody would consider formal traditional training, just being involved in a project and developing it, building on pre-existing skills. So we've we've conducted workshops on several different uh, methods in which we use. We have we have people doing historical research on things that have happened in the past. We've also conducted workshops on MASW uh, um, multi-channel analysis of shear waves for determining, you know, uh, possible. Uh, seismic wave amplification pro problems. We've we've conducted those in many places, and and MASW is very tactile and and very visual, and and so it doesn't take long for the for the trainees to to learn how to do their own surveys as long as we provide the equipment. We've also done. Um, a lot of tsunami evacuation drills and helping people understand how to run these and and 
we've also uh, been able to provide ways in which individual communities can make their own tsunami inundation model. And that's taken a little bit of work, but we've been able to get people from these different communities who have um, background in uh, computing, um, which the younger generation does, and we bring them together. We we teach them how to use GeoClaw, which is you know not a uh, an easy program, but after a few days, they're able to build their own models, and. And you should see the pride of the community when they know that somebody in their community was one that built the model. And and they're much more likely to, you know, actually put the tsunami inundation map up in the city and celebrate the fact that it was made by this group or this person. Sounds great. That's absolutely awesome. So uh, I, I'd like to be respectful of everyone's time as we have reached our end time. And, and I apologize for to those whose questions we haven't been able to get to, um, but thank you for an outstanding discussion. Terrific uh, recap on, on your guys' research programs and, and uh, please uh, everyone have a good day.